I'm a former member of Congress and worked at CBS News and then um, got fired from that. Um, and then um, worked at um, various political PR agencies, worked for Google for seven years, and um, I'm really thrilled right now to be a member of the Stein Institute. And part of what we're discussing during the course of, of my time here at Stein is how the lessons that you learn on a campaign in a political campaign are so easily trans, um, translated into just about anything else that you do in business. Um, figuring out who you need to speak to, what the message has to be, how to form coalitions, sometimes opposition research. Um, all those things that you do uh, on a camp in a political campaign are really important things um, to understand in life. Whether it's the campaign you need to try and get into AU, or to get a date, um, or to get that first job or second job or last job, right? It's a lot of the same skill sets, which are people skill sets. But it's also, and I'm giving away, it is also the um, how you talk about it, right? And one of the things that just makes me crazy is that Aristotle is so brilliant in how he describes communication. And the first thing he always says is know your audience when you're giving a speech. And to me, that is like the fundamental thing that people you know, make mistakes on when they don't know their audience. And so Joel Benenson, who is gonna just uh, come and discuss with us, is somebody that I've worked with. He was, um, well, our, Lucas is gonna introduce him, but I worked with him most closely at Google, but I watched him at um, conventions and during campaigns, and you just find him one of the smartest people I know um, in terms of working a campaign, getting the right message, asking the right questions, um, and being able to constantly figure out not just what the first question is, because usually people's answer to the first question, if you run a whole campaign on that, it's not gonna be good. But what they're really saying, um, and he was really useful and helpful to me at Google. So um, before we get to that though, I wanna introduce the, the students that have assisted me um, in helping to put this together and are like with me all the time. So first of all, I have to introduce Aiden Levinson and thank him. Stand up now, Aiden. Um, and Aiden has his grandmother and grandfather here, so I think we can have a round of applause if not for Aiden. Um, Chris Rodriguez. Hi. Isabel Galacher. Zachary Hill is back here. Okay, he's not here yet, and um, Lauren Monahan is not here yet. They both have class till I think around 5.30, but they'll be coming in. Um, so again, this is you know, what our classes are about. We're gonna have speakers um, that I think will just hopefully give you a great framework um, for people who have formed coalitions, um, how to make things work here in DC, um, the right messages, um, the right messengers. And so I look, you know, hope all of you will look on the board for other um, events that we hold here. I'd like to introduce Amy Daisy, who is the head of the Sign Institute. Hi, welcome everyone. And will be joining me um, on the, the next one on February 25th when we talk a little bit more into the skill sets that you need to um, either run a campaign um, or translate those campaigns. And the one thing that I think is really um, important that everybody takes away all the time is particularly in this town, but in any town, in a time when Republicans and Democrats and conservatives and liberals don't get along and we have this infighting. Um, Amy Dacey used to run the DNC. I'm a former Republican member of Congress. We had our, you know, we would have our battles um, that were not personal and we're able to keep those relationships um, during the course of our time here in Washington, D.C. And so to any of you who I might not see again, and you're here because of Joel, um, I just wanted to you know, say, don't do what you're seeing in the Capitol today, because that's not how you play the long game. And so I hope all of you understand that Amy Dacey's here and I'm here because we played the long game of respect, albeit our differences. So with that, Lucas, do you want me to introduce Joel? And Joel's going to do a presentation, and then we'll take questions and answers. All right. Um, I hope everyone's having a good day. Um, we have well, except if you're a Democrat in Iowa. Well, I'm a Democrat in Iowa. Joel Benson is here. He has been an expert communicator and researcher. Um, most notably, he helped uh, Obama get elected and reelected. He's also helped Fortune 100, 500. Communicate with the public and do research. Um, he's also been on three different presidential debate teams uh, with his expert communication skills. Um, so he's going to do a presentation now, so we're going to open it up to questions. Um, and enjoy. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. You didn't mention that we worked together when I was covering you when you were. Oh my God! I forgot that. Apologies. I forgot you that old. I Joel. think she's trying to forget that. <laughs> Joel was a reporter for the Daily News when I was in politics in New York. So. Yeah. Um, so that just goes to show you how you play the long game. Right. Know? Exactly. Um, it's gotten better through the years. So thank you, thank you for both uh, those introductions. Um, I'm delighted to be here. You know, just before I start showing this to you, I'll explain why I've chosen this. You know, I just got back from a conference in California with, that we do, we've been doing it through uh, NYU for a number of years, and then now it's moved to USC, uh, the Dorn Side Center out there. And, um, you know, it's a group of Democrats and Republicans who have done this conference now together for years after each election in front of audiences. We did it in Florence. We do it in, uh, we've done it now in Southern California for a while, and it's open to the community, and it is respectful. We have differences. We don't convince each other on policies. We don't attack each other. We have a conversation that hopefully lifts up, um, you know, just a dialogue about the state of politics and helps people get more useful information out of it. So in thinking about tonight, um, there are a number of things, and I know this is, the class is oriented more towards policy, but um, I thought I would go back in time a bit. Some of you will remember a lot of this, some of you won't. Um, but even the young folks were pretty active in the re-election campaign um, because it's a really an inside look at research and I can show this uh, from that campaign because it's already been um, presented publicly at the Annenberg Institute, University of Pennsylvania. And that's why it's February of 2013. They, do a post, they used to do a post-election debrief and then they published it in a book. So I feel comfortable uh, sharing this because I don't normally share anything from any of the campaigns I work on publicly. But I think there are lessons that are important here, and obviously I was President Obama's pollster while he was in the White House as well. There were a host of policy issues that were impacted. But that presentation after that campaign was about how values and attitudes can uh, uh, shape winning strategies. The other thing about Plato uh, that you should know is, uh, which many of you probably do, you know, he talked about the rational and the irrational. You know, he saw the emotional side of things and the intellectual side of things. And I think that's important. And I think a lot of times researchers, uh, particularly um, uh, very analytical and statistically oriented people, forget to ask the questions that get at what's going on with the human being beneath the surface. And sometimes that may take two or three questions to get there. So I thought showing how we did this through a campaign will give you some insight, and then we can talk about how um, that might have um, played in any policy. So let's see if I get this right. Oh, look at that. <laughs> so in the fall of 2011, and you know this is early fall, late August, September, a lot of people thought that President Obama was in deep trouble. We had a massive financial crisis. And all the traditional metrics that people looked at and said, well, wait a second. The unemployment rate is over 8%. No president's ever been reelected with an unemployment rate over 7.2%. The right track, wrong track number was 41% saying the country was on the right track, 57 wrong track. His job approval was 43%. And lastly, the Michigan Consumer Confidence Index was 60%. And no president um, had ever been reelected with numbers um, that low. Now, uh, in fact, when we presented this in Annenberg, my counterpart, Neil Newhouse, who's also he's a Republican, but he's a friend of ours and, uh, and mine, and we've done work together, in fact, he was Romney's pollster. He went before me. The benefit of winning the campaign is you go after the person who lost. But he put this number up and showed it all the way through. He said, if you would have told me in August of 2011 that an incumbent president could get reelected with that number, uh, I would have told you to get your head examined. <laughs> And I got up and I said, well, the thing for us was we saw that number in August, but we were still beating Romney, who had pretty much, you know, um, broken to the front of the pack in the Republican field. We thought he was going to be the nominee. So my job is to figure out why are we winning? It's so stacked against us. I have to figure that out. That's my job. And the approach I use generally, and I was a journalist, and so... I bring a lot of journalistic techniques to polling. People who are 
former journalists and current journalists, when I tell them I'd like to hire journalists, they go, that's crazy, why would you do that? And I say, well, think about what journalists do for a living. You try to ask creative, insightful questions that are gonna elicit different, unusual, compelling answers that you can then stitch together in a cohesive, coherent story that's gonna be powerful. That's exactly what you do in a campaign. And that's how you use polling. And you can use that in your qualitative techniques, my focus groups, we use something called that in journaling, or you can use it in polling, and we do that in polling because I'm always gonna come back to talking about um, attitudes and values and where people have a strong um, emotional connection. I call it uncovering the hidden architecture of opinion. So let's go into that just a little bit. So what we had to do during the course of our research was figure out what are the attitudes and values that were having voters still vote for Obama? Where were they in their lives, in particular their economic lives? What were their hopes and aspirations? How had they recalibrated post-crisis? We did a very deep dive, which we call ethno-journaling, modeled on journalism I did, uh, that I started as a journalist. By the way, I don't, you were in Congress probably in 1994, right? Mm -hmm. But it was a front page story in Susan's hometown newspaper, the New York Daily News, that I got by going around the state of New York in uh, the fall of 93, talking to voters about Mario Cuomo, who was contemplating running for a fourth term. And I got interviews and I concentrated on Democrats and independents. And the front page of the Daily News, when I, after I wrote the story on that Sunday, the front page is called The Wood, which is a big thing when you're a reporter because it's the whole front page. It's called The Wood because it's the only thing in a newspaper today that is, was still set in wood type. And it said Mario, the unavoidable governor. And it basically said if he had a decent opponent, somewhat moderate, he could lose. His people went nuts. He ended up losing to a guy named George Pataki that year. Yeah. But I started employing that technique as a researcher. So what we did is we dug in very deeply into their economic lives. We recruited 100 swing voters. We called it the vast middle, middle of the road, middle income, middle America. But middle America just didn't mean uh, the center. It meant kind of that basic set of values, not you know ideological and strong. And we did it in three states. Um, uh, Colorado, uh, Wisconsin, and um, uh, Florida. Each night we gave them a set of compound questions. I won't go into detail, but we did it for six nights, and they had about six or seven questions a night. A hundred people typed up 1,400 pages of transcripts. They wanted people to listen to them. They wanted to be heard, not ask the quick yes or no question. Do you agree with this or disagree with this? They could pour out everything about different aspects of their life, because each night of the journals was devoted to a different aspect. So one night was the workplace, one night was the future, one night was community, things like that. So it was a solid topic, but they could write for as long as they want. They spent an hour each night on their journals. And then we would digest them. We had a whole team of people reading them, and we then followed up at that point with 25 hours of conversations in focus groups, triads, three people at a time, for two hours, not like eight people in a focus group for 90 minutes. Eight people for 90 minutes, they get 11 minutes each. We had three people for 150 minutes. You didn't have to cut anybody off. So the point here is, what we really learned about the Manitoulin is that they had recalibrated their lives, their mindset post-financial crisis. Number one value in their minds now was fairness. They felt that the system I don't want to say it was rigged against them, but it wasn't working for people like them anymore. It had gotten skewed for a number of reasons, right? They were assessing risk very carefully. They were blaming the people they called the risk makers, the people who told them they could afford to refinance their house or lease another car, uh, various things like that. Uh, remodel your house and take a loan for it, get another second mortgage. They felt those risk makers had failed them. And so they were assessing risk in their own lives very carefully and making decisions very carefully. Reciprocity, that, part, that meant in the workplace and it meant in the communities where they lived. You know, there was a, a guy I remember to this day where he was sitting at the focus group table. He said, uh, or it was actually in his journey, he said, uh, I want my company to make money. I want my company to be profitable. 
I just can't live on a 25 cent an hour a week, uh, uh, an hour raise. I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't cause this. I worked hard, I did my job. I just want to be treated fairly, right? So there was a very different sense here about reciprocity, that they just wanted not anything for free, what they deserved for playing by the rules, and they really believed in strong communities and that sense of responsibility and reciprocity. They talked about it in a way that maybe some of you grew up in places like this, maybe you didn't. I grew up in a small place in Queens, and people did this in the 1950s and 60s, you know, that being in a good community in a good neighborhood means if you left your garage door open, your neighbor would come and close it. Or if you left your garbage pails out on the street overnight, someone else would put them back for you so people wouldn't think no one was home. If a car came down the street that you didn't recognize, you might keep an eye on or a person walking down the street in a way that you didn't recognize maybe, you might think twice about, do I need to keep an eye on this to make sure the neighborhood's safe, right? Those kinds of things that they grew up with, they felt had been lost and they wanted some of that back. So let's talk about the post-crisis mindset. We take those attitudes from the journals and then we test them quantitatively. In a poll, we ask people. Now, I happen to believe a lot in what is called top box response. You know, here are a set of simple statements, um, that um, attitudinal statements that we tested. And I like testing them saying, you know, does this destruct, describe you extremely well, somewhat well, um, not really very well, or not at all, right? I usually like what I call top or bottom box, because if people have intensity at about, if they strongly agree with something at about a 40% level, high 30s, you're not gonna peel that attitude or value away from them, right? It's that strong association with it. It doesn't have to be 100%, but that kind of intensity when you're given that, that's also gonna mean that sometimes we look at top two box with the somewhat agreed numbers, but if you look at what the post-crisis mindset was here, they were less willing to take risks with their financial situation because of what happened during the recession. The economic system in America favors the wealthy, not the middle class, and we were trying to appeal to the middle class. I remember we were running against Mitt Romney. They've lowered their financial expectations as a result of the financial recession. This stuff wasn't only relevant for the election we were running in, but this is, this is a threat for America. If you think about us as the most successful capitalist country on earth that built the strongest economy in the world with an entrepreneurial spirit of people who thought, if I do everything right, if I work hard and get ahead a little bit, I can create a better life for my kids. And when you see attitudes like that, this is starting to undermine the fabric of what was once called the American dream. And while there were Democrats in Congress in 2012 talking about rebuilding the American dream, our advice to President Obama as a campaign team was, never use that phrase, because people didn't believe the American dream existed anymore. And that's a simple thing that comes out of research that can be really helpful to anybody who's communicating, right? It can be helpful in a policy issue. Because if you're talking about some idealized version of a, a, an American dream that people don't think exists anymore, you're gonna come off as tone deaf to them. And so we were very careful to not build a campaign around restoring the American dream. And Mitt Romney at that point uh, was campaigning, um, saying he could have done a better job solving this crisis than Obama. He could have done a better job fixing the economy. So here I'm talking about the mindset. You have to get it, see this through their eyes, right? Do you believe what the country faced over the last five years, this was the poll question, has been an extraordinary economic crisis more than any we've seen in decades, or on the right, a typical recession that the country has every several years. And if you go back, Romney was treating it like a typical ordinary recession, not some financial calamity. And yet the American people, the voters I should say, who were probably pretty representative of a general population audience by the way, by three to one, they were saying that this was an extraordinary economic crisis. So if you're dealing with an attitude that says this is something I haven't seen in my lifetime, if you're talking to people about it with language that makes it sound like the language they've heard every time there was an economic downturn, they're going to turn a deaf ear to you. They know it was different and unique, so you've got to find a way to communicate them about that. 
uh, that connects with them. Otherwise, they're going to tune you out. This is um, a general attitude question that was important to us. Um, the, uh, the, when Romney started to talk about saying, I could have done a better job than President Obama, um, and some of the focus groups we did at the time, uh, some respondents would say, look, he was a good businessman, but being president's a totally different job. It's going to take him a year to find his way to the restroom in the White House, right? <laughs> I mean, they just have a sense of it as being this enormous job. And so anybody who's treating it cavalierly and think, you know, they, they say it easily, you're going to sound a little out of touch with them and a little out of touch with their vision. And keep in mind, we're not talking in this research uh, uh, to hard partisans. We're really talking to swing voters, people we can persuade. We know where the hard partisans are, right? But so this question became a very simple poll question. You can see we asked it in June, and then we tested it again in 12. We tested it in June because Romney started to say it. The economic problems President Obama inherited were too severe for anyone to fix in a single term, or a different president would have been able to do more to get the economy moving over the last four years. This is what we call a forced choice question. Sometimes I want people to force a choice. Sometimes I give them that four point scale. But here I want to know. There are two diametrically opposed things. Romney's saying this, Obama's going to say that. Which one is more credible? And if you look at those numbers throughout the entire campaign, this is pretty much showing that Obama was on pretty solid turf here with the case he was making about the economy, and Romney wasn't. Now, why is that a problem for Mitt Romney? He was a businessman. He was running on his expertise. And you're getting this fundamental threshold question wrong about where Americans are seeing the world, right, you're going to come across as a little tone deaf. It's going to be a lot harder to get them to listen to you and uh, buy into some of the programs that you're talking about. So I mentioned the strongly agree numbers that I liked before, so I wanted to show you some data where we use this. So this was, again, a strongly agree, somewhat agree statement. You know, this is very much about the attitudes. We were trying to get at ways that we could explore talking about the economy. There are lots of ways the president uses different phrases. You know, we don't give him language to say. We take the things he's saying on his own and seeing which of them has maximum impact, right? You can't put words in a candidate's mouth. You have to really uh, let a candidate's voice come through. And the question is, can you take his voice? Can you help tweak it if you need to uh, with some of the, the metadata? But you want a candidate to sound like who he or she is. You know, we're living in an age where authenticity is becoming more and more important, not less so. And, you know, you're more exposed than you ever were before. I mean, President Obama's campaign in 2008 transformed how people campaign in primaries to a certain degree. Then you get to the White House, it's a little bit harder. But so if you look at some of the things I talked about before, um, so one of the things we knew is that people didn't think this was an ordinary crisis. And so we wanted to see how much durability was going to be important to that. What America needs is a broad-based economy, not a bubble economy. Because, um, you know, Republicans have done the same thing over and over again. By the way, does anybody here know how high the deficit is? Anybody know if it's higher or lower than it was under Obama? Higher. higher. Way higher. Yeah. It's a record. Mm -hmm. The debt and the deficit in this country are a record. Now... We shouldn't be surprised by that. We've been living with supply-side economics from Republicans to everyone from Ronald Reagan. Hey, 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 now you're moving off script here, Joel. <laughs> George H. W. Bush cut taxes, lost his re-election. George mm -hmm. W. Bush, uh, uh, by the way, Bill Clinton then repealed him. George W. Bush followed the same playbook. He had some intervening events that uh, he was on much more solid footing um, in 04 and he won re-election. But Obama ran on repealing the Bush tax cuts and won them. I have never been in a campaign, and I did work on Clinton back in 95, 96, where the American people think tax cuts for the wealthy help them. And they don't think these tax cuts today are helping them. And Democrats haven't even raised the issue of the deficit yet. Um, investments. What America needs is to make the investments it will take to win in the future. They were very focused on the future because they thought their kids' futures were at risk. And the last one was a middle class focus. What America needs is not to build the economy, it's to build the economy from the middle out, not the top down. Maybe you heard Obama say that from time to time. 
Mm -hmm. Right? It was a very important theory of the case. Build it from the middle out, not the top down one. Working in middle class Americans think they are the heart and soul of the economy. You know, the people who aren't just working 35 hours a week and get six weeks vacation, right? They're the people who are working to put in overtime week in and week out to make money. If you look at all of these statements and look at the numbers in parentheses, if you can't see them in the back, the strongly agreed numbers are all right at about 40% or over and strongly plus somewhat are off the charts. But let's just stick with that top box number. So we were on very solid ground building a strategy for communications around these attitude statements that shaped what people wanted going forward. And I will say that after having done three uh, presidential campaigns uh, successfully, <laughs> you know, never get greedy. <laughs> it was that fourth one that got me, right? <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, what, what you wanted to do is, it, it, my mantra about these things is presidential campaigns, this is true of them in a way that's unique, any head of state, right? Um, they're about big things, not small things. They're about the future, not the past. And they're about their lives, not your life. Yeah. It doesn't mean your bio doesn't matter, but ultimately it's about their lives. It's about the future and it's about big things. And this test that we did, the answers to these things that President Obama had been believing and saying, told us we were on um, very good um, uh, very good shape here. So this is one of my favorite slides. Um, the good thing about polling technology uh, today, notwithstanding what happened to Ann Selzman at the Boeing Register this week, right, the technology is so good that, and my firm does enough polling, that if we need to get in the field, if something happens in the morning and we want to get into the field that night, we can. So here's a question, right? Ronald Reagan, usually when I do this, I show a video of him. Uh, this is the question that he just mailed Jimmy Carter with in uh, 1980. And he said, the question you have to ask yourselves is are you better off today than you were four years ago? And Carter couldn't say it. You know, we had an oil crisis, we had a solid, hot, staggering unemployment and inflation. So the question is, are you better off now? So the Sunday morning before the Democratic Convention in 2012, Ed Rendell, former mayor of Philadelphia, was on TV. Amy may remember this well, right? And they asked him on TV, so are Americans better off today than they were four years ago, right? Like, we're still in the middle of this crisis. And he couldn't answer it. He, like, fumbled around a bit for the answer. The Republicans jumped on it right away, rightly so, right? So I was sitting in the basement of the convention center with Larry Grizzolano, who's a, a friend and a guy, another consultant that we worked on. And we're saying, okay, we got to figure out how we're going to answer this, right? So we kicked around a bunch of questions. We're sitting there for about a half an hour. And then finally we just said, well, let's just see whether there's another simple question that we can use here, right? And so we came up with, a, again, this was a forced choice question. I told you here, right, they're not better off. But what's more important to you vote for president? Which candidate will make you better off uh, four years from now? Or whether you're better off than you were four years ago? Whether you are better off than you were four years ago? And overwhelmingly, people thought what was more important was not whether they were better off than four years ago, but who will make them better four years from now. It's about the future, not the past, right? <laughs> so I always loved this one because it was one of the simplest things. And sometimes, by the way, and this is true even on policy issues, right, when you're polling, you find one nugget that is so powerful that you can use it in your communication. Um, a good example, I'll throw one in here. Okay, a good example of what I think um, the gun uh, 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 control advocates, of, of which I'm, uh, I am one, um, what they get wrong. Right? How many people here think we have universal background checks in America? You've heard the phrase, right? Mm -hmm. Any hands? Anybody believe it? Okay, you know we have background checks, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, but why are they not universal? Anybody know? Gun show. Nobody. Well, that's one. Gun show, internet. The you, Second Amendment? Wait. No. There's another thing. The background check said, you heard of Dylan Roof, right? He didn't buy his gun at a gun show. He walked into a church and murdered eight people at prayer, right? The rule says that if your background check isn't completed within three business days, you get the gun. Think about that. You couldn't get anything else in this country that is 
something of value in three days. You can get a bank loan, maybe a bank loan in three days, but that's because the banks want you to borrow money. But you know, what a notion that in this country that we don't say the background check, we've tested this, a background check should be completed before someone can buy a gun, even if it takes two weeks. Like, why is there predisposition here that, oh, you don't complete the background check in three days, you get the gun. So people on the other side say, we have universal background checks. There's a gun show loophole, the internet, et cetera. Um, but the truth is that that's one simple thing we could close and if people on the gun advocate side would say, you probably think we have background checks, but we don't. If the background check is completed in three business days, the person gets the gun, right? That's not a background check. You couldn't get hired for a job if the background check wasn't completed in three days, right? Why are we letting somebody buy a gun? So sometimes you can get a simple nugget of information that defies common sense. Most human beings um, operate on so I talked about the mindset. Let's talk about the competitive landscape a bit. We're doing okay on time, I think. All right, I'm going to speed this up. First step is do opposition research on yourself, and that's true in the policy case. You have to know what your weaknesses are, right? I've worked on uh, climate change for a long time with some clients. I've worked on some gun issues. One thing I learned on gun issues, for example, in our polling is that uh, and we actually worked with a, a foundation about some gun laws passed in three states to let judges uh, take guns away from people if there was a restraining order against them. But we learned there was a group of kind of reluctant gun owners. They were reluctant to change laws, but you could win them over on, um, on some common sense things. So, you know, you've got to be creative about these things and find a way to communicate. And if you tell them, for example, in the way we concentrated on domestic violence cases, is we told them how many cases there were. I mean, I, you know, the, the uh, domestic violence cases, particularly uh, women being shot by a partner who has a gun, are off the charts in this country. So if you say to people, you know, you probably think that judges can take guns away from people who have domestic violence charges or, or convictions, but they can't, without telling them and trying to educate them you're just saying, hey, there's this common sense thing that you probably got wrong, because you probably believe it like everybody else does, because you don't want to make people ever feel like they're not smart or they're stupid, but you want to say it's such common sense, you probably think judges can, but they can't. And so what we got is three laws passed in three states where judges can take guns away from the House, too, from uh, a domestic abuser. Uh, we knew we had uh, vulnerabilities here. Um, President Obama slowed the recovery, made it worse, 23 million unemployed. He doubled the deficit. He added more debt than all previous uh, presidents. They had stuff to run against him on, right? So what you have to do is know what they are, what they're saying about it, and either decide you're going to take it head on and defend or uh, combat it with uh, a better story. So we decided that given where people were economically during the course of this campaign, we weren't going to play a lot of defense. Um, I think it was Vince Lombardi, a football coach, who once said, um, the best defense is a good offense, right? Uh, but we didn't want to have to get into a debate about everything that had happened in the past. Not that we didn't want to own it, we just wanted to continually focus forward. Anybody remember why? Because what did people tell us they cared about? The future. They were worried about the future. So our goal, our strategic imperative, was to do that. So if we ask a forced choice question, which of the following comes closer to you? A strong middle class is the key to a growing economy, or a healthy climate for business is the key to a growing economy. Remember, this is Obama's argument, this is Romney's argument, and this was done among independent voters, those middle of the road voters I talked about before. It's pretty much a clear dunk. And the other thing Romney was running on was his track record as a business person. And here, another forced choice question, because I said you don't always rely on one the willing, which of the following is most important for a president to have, right? The willingness to fight for middle class families or a technical understanding of how the economy works, which is what Romney was saying. I was a business leader. And who do they want? They want someone willing to fight for the middle class. No surprise at all. Come on in, have a seat if you want. Don't, don't worry about it, sit right up front. So again, sometimes very simple questions like, 
The first lesson I learned in, in polling is the key to writing a good poll is you have to know what you want to learn. Yeah. And what I teach at my firm is that you have to go into the poll with some hypotheses, right? You have to have some theories about what the possibilities are. And what I say to the people, especially folks like you, some of whom are, you know, right out of college who work for us, whether you prove or disprove your hypotheses, you're going to learn something valuable about how you have to uh, change the dynamic, change the conversation, or even find some other way to win your side of the argument. And sometimes you have to go back and do more testing to get to a better answer. But if you don't challenge your assumptions and challenge what you know and challenge what you think you know when you're using this poll as your art form, then you're going to miss some big things that are uh, going to work in your favor. All right, I'm, I'm going to skip some of these because I want to get to your questions. Uh, okay, so I've talked about values a lot, right? So here's a simple statement, forced choice question. Obama economic values. The way to get our country back on track is to start building an economy built to last by investing in manufacturing, small businesses, and education to create jobs our country needs and train our children to succeed in the new economy. Or the way to get our country back on track is to get government out of the way and unleash the power of businesses and markets to create jobs by lowering taxes and eliminating needless regulations that tie employers' hands. Now, if you look at this, we've got 50% who agree more with Obama and 42%. Now, there's a lot of partisanship in there. Democrats buy one side of this argument. We didn't have to name the candidates. It's pretty clear which argument here is, is more belongs to the Democratic Party and which belongs to the Republican. But so with 50% here, what we also wanted to know is among groups that were especially key. I don't know if you can read that box on the right there. But the first group were low-income whites. The numbers there were 52 uh, agreeing with Obama's argument, 39 with Romney's. White independent women. We're hearing a lot about white independent these days. There is one party in America that has a problem with white independent women. Uh, it's called the Republican Party. Um, well, that might just be a candidate as opposed to. Well, it could be. It could be. Um, but, um, no, no, it's okay. Um, but truthfully, in the midterms, you know, Donald yeah. Trump won suburban voters in 2016 by eight points. And in the midterms in 2018, they were even. It was the biggest shift of any block in the country, was suburban voters. Eight points went from the Republican side from plus eight and 16 to even. And you attribute most of that to women. Yes, yes. yeah. Um, White independent women, 51 Obama, 38 Romney. Suburban voters, 52 Obama, 42 Romney. Um, youth, 18 to 34, big time for Obama. So, you know, in April of 12, before we're really fully engaged with Romney here, we're feeling pretty good about the economic argument we're going to make. This is pretty simple. Don't use yesterday's language to win today's battle. So, you know, the word liberal had become a dirty word for a long time, right? Republicans used it very effectively in many campaigns and tagging someone as a liberal or an extreme liberal worked. But what we found when we looked at this, neither of these labels really had the impact that either side wanted. So just don't use them. Right? You're better off talking about substance instead of just trying to hang a label. Now, an exception to that is probably President Trump who does, I mean, his style and his approach is to personalize the race in a way. He's not attacking his opponents. Really, he does it on a global scale sometimes around an issue, but more than anything, he does it in a personal way and tags them with a label that he thinks puts them in a box that will be damaging. Um, I'm gonna skip this one. All right, turning insights into strategy. The last thing I'll do, and then I'm gonna we had to figure out a way to uh, make Romney's uh, business record work against him. We've engaged in some uh, practices. I'm not going to go into this in too much uh, detail here. You know, he bankrupted businesses. He had parked money overseas, all of that stuff. He fired workers in healthy businesses just to drive up profits and sell the company and walk away with millions. But what we did is we didn't use conventional questions. These were practices that a lot of business people engaged in. Again, my thought partner, Larry Grizzolano, and I said, let's, 
let's see if we could come up with questions we've never asked before that would really tell us what we wanted to know. And the two that we landed on after about a 45 minute conversation, one was, this may be one way to run a business, but it's simply wrong. And the other was, um, this is harmful to people like you. And we wanted things that people said were simply wrong, and it was very harmful to people like them, right? One was a two part, one was a four part. That number on the right, outside there, is how many people said these were simply wrong. And then inside, it was harmful. These were like the top of the pile. So we didn't have to randomly throw stuff at the wall on what would stick to Romney. We could stick to these four things, and we made ads out of all of them. This is what we call the campaign architecture. So, very simply, if you take the beginning of this, um, what we talked about, that Romney was going to make this a referendum on Obama's record, right? He was going to say, I could have done a better job. He's been there four years. He's failed to rescue this economy. It's all a referendum. So our strategic imperative was to make this election a forward-looking choice based on a contrast of economic vision and values. Remember all the data I showed you. We don't want to debate issue by issue. We want to debate on the value side. What we know, what we know about where people were in their lives. They were thinking about the future. They thought the wealthy were getting too many breaks. We didn't want to run just create around any one specific policy. We wanted to have a framework that was very strong on a values perspective. So the way you do that is your first imperative is that strategy up on top, forward-looking contrast. And to do that, you have to control the context of the debate. Romney's got his and ours, and it'll sound familiar because we know that people bought into this from the polling I showed you. The economic crisis and deep recession weren't created overnight and won't be solved overnight. And then when we use this in campaigns, we tell people why it works. It was what they believed. And if we didn't control this, Republicans would lay all the problems at Obama's feet. Raise the stakes. This is a make or break moment for America's middle class and those striving to get there. You know, just talking about the middle class can get a little bit hackneyed. Uh, Amy, who's standing in the back, knows Democrats like to talk about that over and over. What about those striving to get into the middle class? Like, there are a whole lot of people who are middle class. The middle class is middle, right? There are people above that, upper middle class, there are other folks. So we broaden the universe we were talking to, but we also raised the stakes. We said it was a make or break moment for those in the middle class and those working to get there. Why did we want to raise the stakes? That makes it more about the future than the past, right? It's a make or break moment. We're either going to get this right or we're not, rather than debate it the way Romney wanted to. And then we wanted to own the middle class, which meant we need to build an economy from the middle out, not the top down. And that's an economy where everyone gets a fair shot and a fair shake, where hard work pays and responsibility is rewarded, and everyone plays by the same rules from Main Street to Wall Street. And that's about it. as as concrete succinct message as I can think I've ever, um, that I've seen in a campaign um, in all my years. So hopefully that gives you a little glimpse about how we construct this stuff. Uh, it's not about asking boring questions, it's about asking creative questions. Um, and we do apply this to, um, you know, corporations. Uh, we do apply it to nonprofits. We're doing work with all kinds of groups now um, and have always. And I think the, the most important thing to think about as we discuss this is this is a creative process, mm -hmm. right? Conventional thinking is your enemy. And you've got to think outside the box. If something doesn't make sense, you know, like one of the first lessons I got in polling again uh, from a guy named Mark Penn, who was Hillary Clinton's pollster in 2008 when she first ran for president against Barack Obama. We know how that turned out, right? <laughs> One of us won, one of us lost, right? Uh, but the first lesson I got from Mark was, um, if a number looks wrong, it probably is. Now, it doesn't mean it is. But if it looks wrong to you, if it defies your common sense, think about it, right? Maybe it's right, but prove that it's right. Figure out if it's wrong. And if it's wrong, you know you have a problem in your data, which, of course, is happening all over Iowa tonight. So, um, let's go to questions thank about you. any of this. First of all, thank you, Phil. I think you can see why working with somebody like this is just absolutely amazing. And I, I want to thank you. I, I miss working
working with you. And just one quick anecdote when I was, why I got so interested in Poland, not well, because I came from a political background, but being in the Republican Party in Congress in the early 90s, we used to talk about family values all the time, right? Family values, family values, because that pulled well. Except, because that was the first question, and family values was off the chart. But when you started to ask, more, when you started to dig deep, right. what came out of all this polling is most people didn't really like their families. <laughs> and so what they were really talking about was that community value, right? right? And so we missed the message, because we kept trying to make people love their families. <laughs> feeling that they were ostracized from their communities. But it took maybe four questions that you had to get to what the right message right. was going to be. Right. And this stuff works in anything. Um, Mark, I was still working with Mark Penn. I hadn't started my firm yet when Microsoft was being sued on antitrust stuff, right, for being a monopoly uh, by the Justice Department. And, you know, one of the simple things Microsoft was doing at the time that people loved but that they weren't talking about was they were putting computers in libraries all over America. And no one at the company was talking about it. Mm -hmm. So anybody who did interviews after that would talk about that, right? It was saying, what was it saying? Hey, we're kind of a surrogate member of your community and right. we get it. And we know that in some places like rural America, right, in some places in urban America, that you may not have the resources that people may have at home. So we're putting computers in libraries. Mm -hmm. And they were doing that all over the country. You know, things that were done, by the way, with, and that was before the antitrust case, with philanthropy in America, we'd forgotten about that. Our public library system was founded by a philanthropist and funded by a philanthropist. So there are ways to apply it. Steve Case, anybody here remember AOL <laughs> when you had to dial in, right, and you got busy signals? So I was doing the research because that was a crisis. They were the biggest company, you know, in the Internet field. Can you believe that? They were the biggest company in the Internet. Um, and when I run into Steve Case from time to time, he doesn't always remember me, I say, I'm Joel Benenson. As soon as I say my name, he says, we're working day and night to fix this problem. Because <laughs> we put him on camera because we knew we had to have the CEO on. It was a simple sentence. People were desperate for their internet. All they wanted to know is that the company was working day and night. Yeah, so. that's great. That's Who else? You. Questions? So what's going on in Iowa? Sorry, then this is going to do we have anything new, Amy, or is it? Nothing new, just reporting 62%, and I, I gave you the, the numbers up there. Should they're I share them with the... At least 62, uh, sure, and, and uh, they're waiting for the rest of the results. So, in terms of, do you guys want um, delegates or popular vote first? Popular vote. <laughs> How many say popular vote? How many say delegates? You know why that's good? Because the currency of the nomination is delegates. <laughs> and that's what Obama always, we always focused on that in 07, 08, right? It was delegates. And that's one of the ways we made, beat Hillary in that campaign was because we understood the delegate population. The delegates reporting, um, with 62% reporting, were Buttigieg, 26.9, Sanders, 25.1, Warren, 18.3. Now, that adds up to about 70%. So it is possible that those are the only three who clear threshold uh, from on the delegates. Well, that's the delegate breakout. But it's possible, based on the, the vote, that that's true also. The popular vote was Sanders, 28,220. Buttigieg, 27,030. Warren, 22,254 and Biden 14,176, uh, which, which means right now um, Biden is a little bit over uh, a 15% threshold, but we'll see how that plays out overnight. But even if it finishes that way, you know, this is where the narrative is going to be problematic for Biden. You know, the, the narratives that will matter the most here is, and, and I've said in a lot of the interviews I've done about Iowa, um, the momentum stories get undervalued. Uh, in the press, and you write them, and people don't you know, contribute, to them, but they have a real impact, um, and they stay with you. So you know, there are lots of ways. A few points, one way or the other, just changes the narrative about how you how you come out. Any other questions? Yes. Values and attitudes are they true? So do you have to reassess with every election? Um. 
I, I think that values, it is a great question, are, are values and attitudes, are they fluid? Do you have to reassess with every election? And the answer is yes and no, right? No, I mean, largely, certain values and attitudes do not leave people. There are probably things that are immutable in your mind, right? Um, let, I'm going to take a controversial issue. Let's say you believe that it is absolutely a woman's right to make a decision by herself whether or not she wants to have an abortion, right? And for whatever, right? That is some. That is an attitude around a specific issue that you believe, and you're probably not likely to change that. But that doesn't mean. Remember, the first thing I did was, you know, you map the landscape, and then you map the mindset. So the landscape is going to inform your thinking about the mindset. Those things we ran on, by the way, in 2012, are not the same that we ran on in 2008. Some of them were. The economic stuff were, but remember, Barack Obama was running against a country where people felt it was very divided. Boy, how wrong were we? <laughs> uh, and I say that only because I'm working with some very significant division in America now. But so there was, there was different. Some of the argument was economic, right, against John McCain, but not a lot. Uh, it was much less about economics and really a lot more about a bigger vision for where America was going. So but the, that's why I say, you know, polling is both art and science. The questionnaire is my art, mm -hmm. right? And I can't just make crap up. I've got to make up stuff that I either hear in qualitative research or I have an intuition from what I'm hearing and seeing people say on television regularly, I'm not commentators or reading quotes from real people in newspapers. So uh, that's our art form. That's the creative part of it. And um, and I, I'm lucky that you know most of my clients like that about us. They don't want to ask the same question over and over again. Um, I think if I if I'm repeating myself, stop me. At my firm, I tell people if they say to me, I say, why are you asking a question that way? and they say, that's the way we've always asked it, I say to them, that's never a good enough answer. I don't tell them it's right or wrong, I say it's never good enough. It's okay to ask a question the same way, as long as you have a good enough reason to ask it the same way. Any other? Yeah? Well, once you've identified these values, how does that transition into what form you bring them to the voter, like digital, print, things like that? You want to bring them in every frame. Great question. What form, when you translate the values, how do you bring them to the voter? The first thing is, is you want, you know, <laughs> you want your candidate to say those things at every opportunity and then so, right? So all of the candidate's interactions that he or she has with the voters, you want that to be a regular part of their riff because if it is, if they're so strongly held by people, that's just going to keep reinforcing, this guy gets me. This guy thinks the way I do. She really understands what I'm struggling with today, right? That connection with the candidate gets stronger, more so through that than any policies. There are very few single-issue voters in America. There are probably some hardline single issues on the right now, more than the left, over the gun issue, right? The NRA, which is, anybody know how many members the NRA has? What? <laughs> Too many. Too many. Five million. Five million. Now they're struggling now, but five million is not a huge organization. Yeah, I, I would have thought it was like five times better. Right. Ten times better. Right. The number of gun, gun owners is significantly higher. Most gun owners are not NRA members, but it's a very effective organization. <coughs> Any others? Yeah. Is there, can I ask you, is there anything about the framework and the way that you approach things through this election and the ones before that wouldn't apply now because either times have changed? When you say anything from those frameworks, would make like the other questions the way that you yeah the things again, you care about. no no you would you would ask different questions there, mm -hmm. there, there, look the data data is disposable mm -hmm. the dynamics change remember the first thing I said what was the dynamic of the race if you go back to the beginning of that Romney wanted this to be a referendum on Obama in 2012 we had those metrics that were all against us so our task in that election was to figure out why were we winning when the metrics were that bad. Remember I said that? So if you're starting this election, well, let's say Buttigieg. My firm is working for Buttigieg. There's a woman at my firm who worked with me on uh, the Obama re-elect and on Hillary's campaign. She's doing this polling, right? You know, one of the things you have to figure out is 
where are people going to be on a 37-year-old guy? Mm -hmm. You know, it's really kind of interesting. You know, the age of the founders, on average, was in the early 30s, by the way. <laughs> in fact, I went back and looked at why we have lifetime appointments for Supreme Court justices. Mm -hmm. <laughs> What's yeah, that? They didn't uh, the average age, yeah. the, the demographers yeah. have gone back, and the average age of a white male who was eligible for the court then, right? Uh, a 30-year-old white male was 60. So like you wow. say, it wasn't that long, right? right? Yeah. Like now we're stuck with, you know, octogenarians galore. <laughs> um, but no, I think, I think you have to think, you cannot assume that the same dynamics that were in play two or four years ago are going to be in, in play always. The macro things that I believe are always true about presidential elections are what I said about big things, not small things, mm -hmm. not the past, your life. But you have to approach every, I mean, that's the fun part of this job. That's why I think it's so creative. You know, people think of pollsters as numbers geeks. I was very good at math, but I never took a statistics class in my life. And I don't need to. I can hire statisticians. <laughs> I don't need to get bogged down in that. And I can understand statistics, but, you know, I understand regressions and correlations and all the things that data analytics folks do. But I don't need to do that. My job is to do this level of research. I like that you're nodding at that. You like that. <laughs> Go ahead, sir. Uh, the Supreme Court lifetime appointment, I think the original intention was to divorce them from political pressure in their jobs as Supreme Court justices. Yes, but I'm not sure if they knew justices were living to the age of 90, well, they would have made it lifetime. Very well. And number two, uh, are you working with any other candidates at the moment besides Buttigieg? Um, and the, you, you can only work with one candidate in the presidential. Well, I, that would be to be one candidate for the Democrats and one for the Republicans. At this point, do you help any of the other possible? No, not at this point because they're competing against each other. Okay. So if my firm's with Pete, no other firm. You know, friendly with them. Uh, are we still on Facebook? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I won't say who it was. One candidate who, uh, uh, before one debate, um, I got off the uh, the plane uh, ahead of this person, being very careful. Uh, <laughs> and this person came up to me and said, uh, "So, do you have any advice for me?" <laughs> And I said, uh, you do know I'm working for another candidate in the race. And the person said, yeah, but I thought you might be able to give me some helpful advice anyway. Um, uh, I said one little thing that was not hugely significant, but could have been important to the person. When the camera's off, I'll tell you what it say, was. This New York Joel is having yeah. such a hard time that thing. <laughs> not as well. Any, anybody else? Let's take one in the back. I feel like this upcoming election, or since 2011, the um, American Times has been messaging versus counter messaging, and the whole um, yeah you, counter you, messaging. You, the truth. you mean contrasting with your opponent? Yeah, and, and all the um, misinformation that pops up now. That well, look, let's take the second part here. first about misinformation, right? And even negative attacks. You know, the general rule is the only time you respond is if it's doing damage, right? So if it's an attack that is either exploiting your weakness, you know, everybody has weaknesses, or is undermining in a significant way a core equity and something that's one of your strengths, right? Stuff that's kind of mushy and doesn't do any damage, and we have the agility at my firm to, you know, we, if a new ad comes out attacking a candidate uh, in the morning, we can be testing that by nighttime uh, and test that ad as long as we can steal, get a copy of it, which we usually can now, and get it with a couple of hundred people within 24 hours and 400 people if we get it in 48 hours. So, you because you don't want to respond to an attack that isn't damaging. You want to ignore it, right? So, by the way, Obama never debated with Romney saying, you couldn't have done a better job than me, right? Now, remember, I showed you data that nobody believed anybody could. I will tell you what we did, and you may remember this, at the Democratic Convention in 2012, because there was only one person we believed who could make that statement, it was Bill Clinton. And in his speech at Bill Clinton in North Carolina, Bill Clinton said, Romney says this. And the way he does it now, let me tell you all something. <laughs> nobody, 
not Mitt Romney, not George W. Bush, not me, could have done a better job than Barack Obama. And the place blew up. They went crazy. It was one of the longest ovations in four days at the convention. But we, we never took that debate. We never decided to have a surrogate smack them down on it until we had what I always call in um, politics and um, also when you're in trouble and we do a lot of crisis management work for organizations and people when something happens, you want a surprising and irrefutable advocate, right? So Bill Clinton was both of those. You know? I mean, of course, he's a former president. He's going to advocate the Democrat. But obviously, Obama had beaten his wife the earlier campaign. And he was also irrefutable because he was a president. Who else could say it? How could you argue with him? And of course, the, the reaction was great. So, and I will I would say also that sometimes the biggest mistakes people made is responding to attacks that they shouldn't mm -hmm. and negative stuff that they shouldn't. So, any others? Yes, sir. Well, this may be a little um, an outlier away, but when does does Trump have a you know a, a some kind of a polling that's working for him, or is he just doing his own kind of off the top of his head? That's a really good question. Um, a lot of, to, to add on that, a, a, you know, some of Obama's message is what Trump used very successfully in the Republican primary, yeah. right? It's, yeah. These um, guys don't get you, it's the way... Right, because he's appealing yeah, to... His, well, don't forget Kellyanne Conway was a pollster. Yeah. I mean, you probably knew Kellyanne, mm -hmm. but... Um, Kellyanne Conway was a pollster, but they used in the first campaign a guy named Tony Fabrizio who's a very good guy. I'm sure they use some polling. But, you know, Trump is Trump. I mean, he's he's going to do what he trusts himself more than anybody else. They do have an extraordinary digital operation. Um, and, um, you know, I don't know if the guy who runs it for him speaks Russian or not. But, uh, um, but um, it is an extraordinary operation. They have built it up, and they've built it up more. Um, uh, I think, uh, uh, but I think Trump is, uh, you know, he's unique in style. He's the anti-politician for a lot of people. But look, there are, there are things historically, um, the only president who lost the popular vote in their first election and got reelected was George W. Bush. Okay, that's one thing. Um, but the map is different, the population is different, the other thing I would tell you uh, is that um, we've had only 11 first-term presidents, I think, who sought re-election and didn't win. You know, there's a, a pattern there, right? There's a, a lot of people get re-elected. But Trump's style is Trump's style. I don't think he has the capacity to change. I think people have talked about and written about his narcissistic tendencies, his dissembling. Um, I think, you know, uh, I don't think he's, a, you know, the other thing is, I mean, you know, I'm of an age where, you know, I don't think I'm going to change a whole lot in my life. Trump's older than I am. I don't think he's going to change what he does. Um, he can't suddenly become a powerful, eloquent orator. Right. It's not who he is. He's a shouter, a screamer, right. a bit of a bully, uh, a bit of a sarcastic uh, uh, attacker. Well, it had more to do, I guess, with his, you know, he seems to be strictly opinion of the base. Part of your polling, you're asking independents, you know, as a, as, you know, will you join us or could you possibly join us? Right. He doesn't seem interested in yeah. enlarging it, and I'm just wondering if that can be a winning strategy or how, how, the, or how the Democrats can kind of counter that, I guess. Yeah. Well, look, the, um, he lost the electoral, the popular vote by more votes than anybody who managed an electoral college vote. So as the country changes, that scenario becomes more plausible that you can, and it'll, be, it'll put attention on our democracy. If that gap grows larger, which is still possible, um, he could get reelected and still lose the popular vote by 2.6 million or more, possibly this time. The one thing that they may not have, and this will be something for us all to watch, Hillary Clinton lost three states by 77,000 votes combined, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin. 660,000 people voted third party in those states. 660,000 people, almost 10 times as many as the margin across those three states. That's pretty astonishing. Yeah. Um, so those are gonna be things to watch. And I think a lot of people who may have been in that bucket, remember Hillary and Trump had 
historically high unfavorable ratings for presidential candidates. They were both at 57% not honest and trustworthy. They were both underwater on their favorable ratings. We had not had an election in modern times where both candidates had numbers like that. That may not be the case this time. Yes, sir. It seems like the argument that a lot of Democrats have been making. Could you speak up just a little bit? I'm Sorry. hearing you, but these old people in the front. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't hear you. Right? You didn't hear them, did you? Well, I can't hear okay. You. There you go. Uh, it seems like the Democrats running for president in Iowa recently have been making an argument claiming that they're the elected or beat Donald Trump, and he seems like beating the incumbent president who ranks number one about among voters' um, preferences for their president. Or well, is so here's, here's where the human dimension really comes in, right? Um, I think I think every Democrat wants to beat Donald Trump. Um, I think every Democrat wants to win against the Republican in every election. Um, but I also think voters want to fall in love, or at least fall in deep like with a candidate, right? Like, we'll test it. You know, here we'll see what happens, but you know, a lot of polls, even in Iowa, showed that people thought Joe Biden could best beat Donald Trump, but he's not coming in first in the caucuses right now, right? If those numbers hold up, right there, what will that say? The Iowa is no different than any other state. People say beating Trump is extremely important to them, but I think, particularly when you've got a big field right now. Uh, a lot of people start to believe their candidate can beat Donald Trump, and whether they're right or wrong will be proven over the course of the campaign. Was that a hand for a question? Yeah, I was wondering how you feel about um, the length of the um, uh, election law, but how long the campaign cycle lasts, and how we could be talking about anything today, but there's more like a bluebird sitting out there with way more money than everybody put together and wants to get on stage. And So let's take the first part. They're two very different questions, right? So the first question about the length of it. I mean, there are two sides to that, right? Yes, it's a long time, but the reason it gets covered is because people are interested, apparently. You know, the networks and the newspapers know what their readers want to read. Particularly now, I think, and it goes back to this gentleman's question, Donald Trump is an extremely polarizing figure. In fact, today, I think it was the first day since he's been president. He's the only president since Gallup started polling who has never had a day over 50% in approval rating. But he's at 50% or 49 today, his highest approval rating, I saw that. But look, I think, I think the length of time isn't bad because people are engaged, people are volunteering, people are paying attention. Isn't that better than when we used to wait until after the conventions and then we only paid attention at the conventions and we had three months of campaigning? Um, I know it's a very long time. The other thing is it's gotten more expensive to campaign, but it's also about engaging people on the ground. You know, one of the things we know, as much as Bloomberg and his television works, they're also building a ground operation. You know, person-to-person -person contact has gotten more and more important. You know, certainly since 1996, which was my first presidential campaign. I mean, Obama did it in 08, and people were skeptical in 07, 08, that it was really going to work. Oh, that's great. They're doing all this stuff. These people aren't going to show up at the caucuses. And he won the caucuses by eight points in Iowa. So now people know that it's an effective means of communication. And it's like everything else. Person-to-person -person communication is pretty powerful. Um, and even if it's strangers sometimes, if you're a volunteer, like building volunteers is important. I think Mike Bloomberg, from what I understand, is paying a lot of people a lot of money. Um, he's driving up the cost of, uh, this is unfortunate, but he's driving up the cost of hiring talent. Like, let's say three yeah. people drop out. He's going to offer money to some of these people that they're going to take, and that's going to make it hard on some of the front runners. And he's guaranteeing them their pay beyond the campaign, right, through December 31st. Like, he's skewing that with money in a way that no other billionaire has ever done before. So I don't think the length bothers me. 
Uh, what was your other part of the question? Well, for some, well, the, well, the you, you second part was like, if the elections are so long that you actually almost have several elections within one because now you get to Super Tuesday and suddenly you'll have a candidate that will win before there's right. that dynamic. And this is, and, and you could be spending your whole time trying to win or over votes with people whose opinion may drastically change in three months once Michael Bloomberg comes. Yeah, but they, they get a chance in the general election. I mean, that's, that's the way it goes. You can't have one. I don't think we'd ever have a national primary day. Some countries do that. Um, I think France does it in their primaries. I think Germany does it in theirs. Um, but by and large, I think we've become more interested in politics than they were, you know, even, you know, notwithstanding civil rights and the war when I was in college, um, or in Vietnam, I think the populace at large is more interested. We're seeing it in the turnout. We're getting record turnout numbers, right? So. I don't know that people's appetite for politics has increased or they're being bombarded so much they just go and do it. We've made it easier to vote in some places, even though some places it's, it's still hard to vote. You know, you got vote by mail. You got, you know, uh, no ex early you, you know, early voting. You know, a lot of states you don't need an excuse for an absentee ballot. So a lot of that is engaging people more. I don't think that's a bad thing. You know, the midterms in 2018, record turnout. A 100-year historically high uh, turnout, 114 million people. It's only 20 million people less than in the presidential election. It was astonishing. So I don't think that's bad for democracy. Something, you know, whether it's because you hate somebody or you love somebody, passion is getting people into the process, and that's a good thing. I, I do think that it's interesting. Like, you can get really jealous of, like, a British election that's called and it's going to be three months later, right? We always, like, especially when you're an operative on a campaign, they say, and I, I do have sympathy for some of the Iowa operatives who've been working at this for years and did know, you know, that night. But I think the other thing that I would just add, and I just feel strongly about this, it's not just about the election cycle and who gets reelected. This engagement has really helped to keep elected officials accountable mm. and paying attention, which I think is a really important part that as well. Like I know when Susan was in Congress, like you, you, you listened to what your constituency was saying. Absolutely. You had to engage them. And I think this engaged electorate is, is forcing that in the conversation too. So it's an election cycle, but it's also that constant like keeping accountability too. I'll tell you what I'm concerned with more about its impact on the democracy is uh, our media dynamics. And that's going to be a tough genie to get back in the bottle. But we are more fractured yeah. as a people because we have a more fractured media environment where people can consume the news they agree with mm -hmm. and only the news they agree with. Right. How many people here watch CNN? Show of hands. Anytime. How many people here watch MSNBC? How many people here watch Fox? Okay. Right. Um, you know, and I know there are some Democrats that complain about Fox, but if we don't go on that now, I go on Fox um, whenever they ask. Uh, if we don't go on those networks, we're never going to be heard. Um, radio. Uh, we've got to use the means of reaching people in their cars. There's a lot of people in parts of America are sitting in their cars listening to radio, and we need to get, you know, as a Democrat, we need to get surrogates on that. Honestly, but, Republicans think that one of the things that was the, that made Talk radio started yeah, it. You know, well, and, and well, <laughs> talk radio started it. Now, uh, uh, mm -hmm. there's some interesting things here. Um, I believe that the, the dynamics changed in 1998 when Newt Gingrich makes a pact with Ralph Reed and the Christian Coalition yep. to be its organizing arm. It's when the conversation starts about being able to bus people from churches to elections, preachers being able to talk about elections, right, without losing status and things mm -hmm. like that. But that actually started. There's a great book called Fault Lines by uh, Julian Zelizer and Kevin Cruz. Ronald Reagan actually tapped into that in 1976. 
because Pat Robertson, who was a televangelist, had a radio show. And Reagan, of course, his you know, career began in radio. He was a radioactive, right? Which they actually had back then. Um, and then he really exploited it in 1980 when he gets elected. So he dabbled with it in 76, he loses there, but comes back four years later and puts it to work. White evangelicals in America comprise about, in any particular election since we've tracked it in 2000, 25 to 28 percent of the vote. And Republicans win those voters by 75, 25 pretty much in every election. So that's become the Republican base. The party has lost everybody else, the other 75% uh, of the country in every election since then. Now, they've kept that margin close sometimes, and that's when they have a success. Once they get that margin outside of the white evangelicals, you know, under eight or seven points, that's when they start getting competitive in some places. But, um, so that's part of that media environment that, you know, has uh, created a more divided country instead of you know, and I'm not saying that three networks in the 1950s and 60s was the best way to have it, but we grew up in that period having one conversation. Everyone there was no difference from, between those networks, and it wasn't 24 hours. Yeah, everyone drank from, everyone drank the same lemonade, and the argument was more or less sugar. Now there's all different flavors of lemonade, and you're not exactly sure if you're yeah. orange juice. Right. Yes, that's a great way to put it. So, and I, and I think... Look, I think we have real threats to our democracy right now. And as much as we revere the founders and the Republican Party, you know, landed on this, and I don't think it was intentional regarding the Supreme Court at some point. I don't think they were thinking of all the implications around strict constructionism and original intent, which the founders never believed, by the way. The founders didn't believe this document was immutable. They believed the people would change it and should change it, right? So the notion of original intent when we're talking about the Supreme Court to me is a completely specious uh, uh, legal theory to begin with. But let's tell you the Senate was created to be the elite body, right? It wasn't elected by the people. It took a long time until we had popular vote of senators. They were originally elected by state legislatures, right? Um, and the small states really fought hard. Originally, the founders, the first draft, had proportional representation for both houses. And the small states fought, fought it. They said, we'll be overpowered if we do that. So they said, okay, but they still wanted it to be an elitist body. So they had longer terms, and they were chosen by the state legislators, already elites who had been elected, right? So they did that. But the ratio of the largest state to the smallest state in population at the time of our founding was about five to one. Biggest state was five times bigger. Today, the biggest state is 55 times bigger, 55 times bigger than the smallest state. So I can take one pool of people of 55 million, and they have two United States senators. I could take another pool of people of 55 million people, and they have 28 United States senators. And if you wonder why the Senate is broken, there's your answer. <laughs> that is so out of whack with the idea of our founding principles and democracy. It's absurd. The Electoral College. I mean, I know people revere these institutions. Here's my view, and it goes back to the media environment. We only have one national election every four years. One chance to pick the person who's gonna lead the country. Why the hell shouldn't it be the people directly <laughs> who choose that person? One chance every four years for your voice to be heard instead of distorted by an archaic system created by a lot of elitists who wanted elites to have control over the process. Because keep in mind, how the electors are picked in every state, they're not chosen by the people, chosen by the state legislatures. Because at that point, they thought the state legislatures would be powerful and would have control over it. So I wasn't always for the popular vote, but as these distortions get bigger, we're either gonna change some of these things so that we become more unified as a country, or at least are able to speak with, I don't want to say a unified voice, but that the voice of the people actually carries more weight. Thank you. Joel, I, I just want to, first of all, thank you so much for this. Thank I you. think you can see, and, and I do want to put a point on this, because this is obviously where the conversation's going. The Sign Institute was created by Jeffrey Sign, specifically because he wants to get rid of, not the partisanship, I think you can 
all acknowledge that you know a healthy democracy works with attention. I think that political parties bring, but the lack of comedy, the lack of respect, the polarization, the idea that they, if you disagree with me, that you are wrong, and that you know that 435 members of Congress from across the United States can accomplish anything if there's not compromise somewhere along the line. And that is broken down in terms of the tribes that rule. I mean, Joel, you remember, it wasn't that long ago where committees were how you were oftentimes broken down. You had your Republican and Democrat tribes, but boy, if you were on the Transportation Committee or the Rule Committee, the chairman and the ranking minority really stuck together and respected each other, and you didn't come in and say something bad about one or the other. Um, that there was that level. And so I want to thank you all for being here, Joel. I want to thank you for giving us all your time thank because you. that really is what Amy's trying to create here, and that is so we can have a dialogue. We can enjoy politics. We're all in Washington, D.C. for one reason, right? Because we think this is a pretty exciting place to be. But we can do that without vilifying somebody on the other side. And so I really thank you for putting a finer point on what Jeff Fine hopes to continue to create here in Washington, D.C. Thank you, Joel. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Uh, so I'm coming up live for January 25th when, um, Feb yeah, January, February 25th, when Amy and I are going to be taking a lot of what Joel just spoke about and translating it into public policy, um, business, and, and, you know, the, the numbers, the strategies, the way we discuss things. And just for a little tickler, we're gonna, I'm going to talk about how things like the guy who wrote The Art of War and Pope Francis and Plato and Socrates and Maya Angelou all have basically the same message. So please come to class <laughs> on that day to find out exactly what that is. And, and again, um, I think we're going to take a lot of these skills and put them to how you can use this in your, your day to day, um, advocating for whatever campaign you're going for. But again, to talk about how we need to sort of come together. And